Hey, this is Pastor John. Thanks so much for tuning in to either download or stream this study. Uh, we pray that this blesses you. There are a couple of things that we would like to lay before you quickly. Uh, number one is that you would consider this message supplemental in your walk with the Lord, that in no way would it replace either your being plugged into the church at the local church level or you listening to your local church pastor who has been charged with the care for your soul. Having said that, we do pray that um, this study of God's word would, would help you see and savor the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we would pray also that if, if this ministry blesses you, that you would prayerfully uh, consider supporting VXV. And if you do, you can do so by clicking on the link below or by going to our website at vxvchurch.com. Now, I pray that God stirs your affections for Jesus Christ as you, as you dial into now the, the proclamation of God's word. Well, good morning. good morning. Hey, where's Brad Doan? Brad, are you, are you in here today? He's what? Okay, well, when Brad gets back here, maybe he'll be back here in a minute. I want him to stand up. A good friend of mine uh, it wanted to, to share this with you. It, it's rare when you, when you get somebody in the body that, that can do some of the things that Brad can do and We've had a couple of those guys in the past, and, and, and I know this is just a shameless plug uh, for somebody in the family here, but Brad has entered into, he's stepping out on his own and venturing into the home repair business. I've had him at my house. Uh, Mike has had him at, at his house. He is super talented, very quick, does great work, um, and he's got some cards over there on the uh, cafe counter to the left of the coffee uh, give him a call for any kind of home repair type things that you might need. Um, I, I think the last time we did this, maybe three or four years ago, if my memory serves me correctly, we had a guy do the same thing and he quickly filled up and was three or four months out with all of his work. So if you need anything done, I, I, I have yet to run into a guy that's this quick and this talented. And, and, and more than that is just the integrity of the man. He's a great man of God and um, just a super guy all the way around. And Brad, is that you walking around back there? Wave to everybody. Come out here. Uh, I've been talking about you for a while. Yeah, that's Brad right there. Raise your hand, brother. That's the guy. And again, his stuff is over there. Just wanted to mention that um, a real value to this family here at Verse by Verse Church. Okay, so let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 8. We made it down to verse 28 the last time we were together. And it has been a minute, has it not? So that's where we'll pick it up today, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 28. So great uh, to be back with you all. I have missed you, VXV. Now, uh, you remember, it is Matthew's explicit objective to demonstrate that Jesus of Nazareth is indeed the Messiah of the world promised in the Old Testament, that, that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that this King Jesus, he is the one who has come to set up and establish his everlasting kingdom. And so what Matthew is doing here on the Miracle Mile in chapters 8 and 9 is he is giving us demonstration after demonstration of this King Jesus' power. We have heard what he has to say in the Sermon on the Mount, greatest sermon in the New Testament, and now we're seeing what he can do. Though the people were astonished at what Jesus had to say and teach, never had they heard such words of power and authority. Nevertheless, in their fickleness, the people would say, just like we do today, well, talk is cheap. Let's see what you got. To which Matthew is all too happy to comply. Now, if you're Matthew... And you are setting out to prove that Jesus of Nazareth really is the guy, then you are going to have to show his power over sickness. You are going to have to show his power over nature. You are going to have to show his power over sin. 
and you are going to have to show his power over death. We have seen his power over sickness in a very broad, dramatic spectrum already the last time we were together. We then saw his, his power over the forces of nature in, in just a striking, spectacular fashion. He, he literally told the elements of the earth and sky to shut up, and they instantly complied. The next time we get together, we'll see his power over sin, and then eventually we'll get to his power over death. And now sandwiched in the middle of all of that, this week we are going to see his power over the demonic realm. We are going to see uh, his power over the, the supernatural now as well as the physical. Now, as you look at how Matthew, under the inspiration of the Spirit, has arranged his presentation, if you're paying attention, you can see a very deliberate, intentional order and purpose here. As Jesus is exercising his power, we see it being exercised over ever-widening spheres, okay, where there's just a very natural progression evident. He begins in the physical realm by healing human sickness. The sphere is then widened over nature itself, still in the physical realm, right? And now this morning, we will see that range extended even further into the spiritual realm. And with that extended range, then, we are going to see what the power of Christ is ultimately producing. And that is, of course, power over sin and death. The wages of sin is death, right? Romans 6.23. And Christ, of course, in taking death upon himself has solved the problem of sin and death for his elect. By the time Matthew is through here, now, he will throw in a few more miracles for some added color and depth, and each with a specific purpose. But by the time Matthew is through here, there will be no stone unturned, if you will. He will have shown us most definitively Jesus' complete and comprehensive and total pervasive power over, well, Everything. Okay, absolutely everything. Now, as we drill down into our passage here concerning the um, demonic realm, we, we find ourselves getting into an area that both fascinates and frightens all at the same time. Which is to say, we tend to either be very curious about the demonic realm or we're likely to dismiss it altogether as some kind of fantastical nonsense because we find it all rather scary, almost in a cartoonish way uh, for many. But even as Christians, we tend to be rather polarized when it comes to angels and demons and all of this business But because, quite frankly, the Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about them. All right? And so we can find ourselves... Again, getting cute with forces we really ought not to get cute with. C.S. Lewis helps us here. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. And the other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves, of course, are, are equally pleased by both errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. So then, what, what I take Lewis to mean here uh, practically is this. In one sense, we need to be aware of the reality of evil, that there are these spiritual beings who appear to want to erase the image of God from among the children of God. And we'll see that very vividly in our text this morning. But, but in the other sense, we should never, we should never, and, and I, I rarely want to use that word never, except for in an event such as this. We should never see these beings, this, these demons, these devils, as being in some kind of equal competition with God, right? You know, it's Satan versus God, and it's good versus evil, and these kinds of nonsensical comparisons, as if these fallen created creatures are somehow uh, even on the same playing field with the living creator God. Now look, 
There is no competition and there is no comparison and any attempt to su- even suggest such, it is just not true and totally antithetical to the scriptures. There is no comparison. They are not even within galaxies of being on the same playing field with our Lord. But, but rather, the scriptures present these little buggers as merely being pawns at the Lord's disposal in his sovereignly maintaining the, the free agency of men. And so on the one hand, we are not to be ignorant of their schemes and their devices and their designs upon us. As the late Sean Connery said, it is wise to know the ways of one's adversary. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) That's the only impression I got, so I whip that out every three or four years. And yet on the other hand, so it's wise to, to, to know the ways of one's adversary. And yet on the other hand, if you are afraid of devils or you are worried about demons or you somehow think it's your job to chase them out of St. Joe County, well, then you do not have the right theology and you are going to open some doors that I do not think you want to be opening. All right. As Lewis has said, it is not at all a good thing to have a, a kind of excessive and unhealthy interest in forces we know so very little about. And this has been a big fail uh, in the American church over the past two decades. Way too much attention upon the demonic realm. Not enough attention on Christ. We'll, we'll get, get to that some more. And so as we prepare, all right, uh, to deal with this admittedly mysterious and fascinating passage, and it is, if we can do so with reverence and humility, there are some things I believe this text will help us to demystify about demons. And yet, paradoxically, we are going to have to remain content with an element of mystery, this side of the resurrection. Clear as mud? Great. Now, far more important than any of these types of concerns is not what this passage tells us about demons, but what this passage is going to tell us about the Lord Jesus Christ. This passage is going to exalt Christ. It is going to elevate Christ. It is going to glorify his brilliance and his power and his extraordinary benevolence and compassion towards even the most down and out among men. Now, now if you think that you've got that friend or that family member that, that you somehow believe is too far gone for the reach of Christ, this passage is going to bring forth much needed correction and encouragement there. Now, at the very same time, our text is going to indict the inferiority Uh, of these demons and the stupidity and short-sightedness of those who unwittingly choose to align themselves under them, what we're going to see great unbelief uh, in our passage as well. So again, just a marvelous, marvelous passage here uh, on the miracle mile here in Matthew. And, And yet I think you'll discover a very strange passage as well. Right? We, we've got demons moving from humans into pigs and skydiving off a cliff. All right, Weird, weird stuff here. We're going to try and make some sense of that. And yet at the end of the story, I also believe you are going to discover one of the most compelling, beautiful portraits of the mission and the magnificence of Jesus that you'll find anywhere. Okay? Now then. Finally, by way of introduction, uh, the other gospel writers, Mark and Luke, they have considerable detail to add to our story here. They cover it in much greater length. And I want to give you all a bit of a heads up here. When, When you harmonize the gospels, when you harmonize the gospels here, excuse me, you have a rather, um, disturbing picture of demon possession in our story. It is very, very vivid and and yet a very um, revealing picture of what it is the devil's will for man is. Okay? And so as instructive and as profitable as this passage is, 
definitely not for the faint of heart. And so as we're reading through this text, okay, uh, let me encourage you with this up front. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Christ came in this world to destroy the works of the devil, and Matthew wants us to see today that he has the power to do just that. That is why this text is here. Now, why do you think, have you ever supposed, why do you think you have all of these passages in the New Testament where where Christ is, is casting out demons? So you could attend the supernatural school of demon slayers? No. So you could know that he has power over the works of the devil. This stuff isn't here to spook you, VXV. It's not here to frighten nor alarm. These texts are furnished to you and I that we would know that Christ has complete power and dominion over the demonic realm, that they can do nothing apart from his permission, that they must and in fact do obey the Son of God, and that, in fact, ready for a surprise, you just might see them worship Christ. Somebody says, well, how in the world is that possible? Well, all of that and more coming up on the next edition of VXV, now. (laughs) Okay, we get after it and go to work again here. Here in the 28th verse of Matthew chapter 8, Uh, Here in the Miracle Mile, crazy story, super profitable story, beautiful story as well. Let's go, verse 28. When he, Jesus, uh, when he came to the other side into the country of the Gadarenes, two men who were demon-possessed met him as they, he and the disciples, uh, were coming out of the, uh, as they, uh, I'm sorry, they met him, Jesus, as they, the demons, were coming out of, notice, the tombs. They were so extremely violent, underline that, extremely violent, that no one could pass that way. And by the way, Mark tells us that they were screaming wildly, All right, just screaming, just a a crazy pitch. We'll get to that. Luke tells us they were buck naked. All right, and so you've got two crazy, possessed, naked dudes running up to meet Jesus and the boys. Okay, now, I mean, it's it's those are the facts of the narrative. I can't help but uh, have a little fun with the transition here because to me, again, it's just very helpful to immerse yourself into the scene. And and I I find it helpful for me to just get in the scene, sometimes imaginatively granted. But these, what we are reading, are actual events being played out in the narrative. This is not a fairy tale or even a parable. These events actually took place in northern Israel in the year of our Lord, A.D. 27. All right? And so I find it most helpful, again, I'll remind you, to see this as much, much more than black ink on white paper. So let's check back into the scene uh, before us quickly here. Now, backing up a couple of weeks, you remember that at sundown on the Sabbath, all of northern Israel had brought their sick and their ill to Jesus, and he healed every single one of them. He healed them all, giving us a fantastic picture of the kingdom that he is uh, here to establish, where, where there will be no sickness and no disease at all, ever. Extraordinary preview there. Well, then, after a very long evening of, of healing there and the, the, the Jesus of Nazareth international healing ministry, our Lord directed the boys to grab the boat, right? Guys, get the boat ready. I am going to get into that boat. You are going to follow me into that boat. And we are going for a little boat ride. All right, I'm pooped. I'm going to hit the poop deck, literally, Mark 4, 38. Okay, and wake me up if you need anything. And of course, wake him up they would. As the Lord, you remember, led them straight into the center of a superstorm there in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. Now again... These disciples found themselves in that storm for no other reason than they were following Jesus Christ.
Just because you find yourself in a storm, brother or sister, does not mean you have missed the will of God. Go back and get that study if you missed it. Our Lord led those boys into that storm in order to expose their unbelief. He led those boys into that storm in order to expose their unbelief, and that's what he does to you and I as well. Christ was shoring up their faith, if you'll pardon the pun. At any rate, Jesus gets up, tells the storm to shut up, and the boys became exceedingly afraid, not at the storm they had just endured, but at who it was that was in the boat with them, who who just took instant command over the natural elements of the universe. Who in the world is this man in the boat with us? They were struck stupid with fear. The fear of God had come upon the 12, which we said last, last time we were together was what? The beginning of wisdom for these disciples, okay? Just as the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom for you and I. Extraordinary story, man. Extraordinary power over the natural. Now, here's where I find myself using my sanctified imagination here. Knowing what they've been through, can you imagine the disciples at this point, right? I mean, it had to be one heck of a day or two, one heck of an evening. I I would imagine they were beyond drained both physically and emotionally, right? right? Seaweed still wrapped around their heads, vomit all over the front of their tunics or whatever it was they were wearing, right? But hey, the water and the wind suddenly as smooth as glass, still as a stone, they finally reached the beach on the other side of the lake, and maybe there's a collective sigh. <sighs> and no sooner do you think you're in for a reprieve, right, than you've got these crazy buck-naked dudes running at you. Rawr! Right? I mean, I could see Peter looking at Andrew. Are you serious, man? I mean, are you kidding me? The 12 have walked right out of the Poseidon adventure and into the night of the living dead. Right? And so double feature uh, for the disciples here. Uh, But is that not the way it so often goes with you and I? Just when we think we've uh, endured some some storm or some tempest in life, and before you know it, you've got the next one running up right on you. Now, the first thing I think that we need to do Uh, in order to complete the picture, is run over to Mark and Luke uh, and and grab a more complete picture of what we're dealing with uh, in these two men. Uh, Here's Mark's gospel, chapter 5. Let's take a look at this. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, notice, immediately, the reception committee was right there, right? Immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs. Imagine that living in a graveyard, right? And no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain, for he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles to pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, again, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out, and notice this now, cutting himself with stones. All right. Now, now, there's a number of things to notice here. First of all, that these guys were immediately on the scene as soon as the guy stepped out of the boat, which, of course, we had a little fun with. Now, there are all kinds of um, academic discussions concerning where this town actually was on the eastern side of the Sea of Galilee that I don't believe it would be super profitable for us to spend time on. What we do need to know is that these graveyards would be well outside the outskirts of any town, okay? Particularly for the Jews because the dead in the graves, like like that was the most unclean thing um, to the Jews. So somewhere between this town and where the boys docked, okay, you have this graveyard. Now, uh, for what, whatever it's worth, um, I believe the town of Gergesa fits the bill here because we know there are very steep cliffs there, which will become prominent later in the text. None of the other candidates in this academic discussion, uh, Gadara or, or 
uh, Garassa there further inland even makes sense to me. Um, but for whatever that's worth, uh, for our purposes here, okay, I want you to know, as Matthew does here, that nobody went near these guys because they were nuts, right? And lo and behold, this is precisely where Jesus chose to land. Isn't that beautiful? Because in his power, he can do for men what they cannot do for themselves or one another. This is nothing other than divine appointment, VXV. Great story in the making here. Now, um, we'll get to to Mark in a second. Look look at your text with me in verse 28. Why does Matthew say nobody, uh, why, why does Matthew tell us nobody can pass this way? Well, again, notice what I had you underlined. They were extremely violent individuals. And now Mark here fills in a little color for us. It is interesting to me that Mark and Luke focus only on one of these guys. Neither Mark nor Luke say there was only one. And of course, Matthew lets us know there were two. Maybe one of these guys is a spokesman. We don't know. Now, we learn from Mark and Luke... One of the things that they were very strong, all right? They could not be bound. Far more compelling to me, though, is that these guys were living among the graves. They made the graveyard their home. That's very symbolic. It speaks of death. And so, so you've got individuals obsessed with death here. And of course, they're possessed, but they're obsessed with death. Furthermore, notice they are cutting themselves with stones, And of course, even today, we see this behavior with emotionally disturbed individuals, right? And so you've got violence, you've got anger, and you clearly have self-destructive behavior here. Now, when Mark tells us they were crying out, this is the word kradzo in the Greek here. It means to shriek, it means to scream, it, it means literally to croak in the Greek, okay? And so the idea in the original language is this, this, this very um, uh, guttural, kind of inarticulate shrieking going on, okay? Now, when we go over to Luke, we discover they were naked and had been so for quite some time, evidently, driven out here to this graveyard in the desert, the wilderness, right? They had not put on any clothing for a long time, and they were driven by the demon into the desert. Nobody wants to deal with these crazy, violent, arm-cutting, naked guys here, and so they are driven out into the desert by these demons, which is where uh, demons would love to drive you and I towards, right? The desert, the, the wilderness. What interests me is this, because it was out in the desert that Jesus was led to to deal with his temptation there in Matthew chapter 4. So Bible students, very cool comparison here, right? Matthew chapter 4, we saw the perfection of Christ in dealing with withstanding the temptation of Satan, right? In chapter 4, we saw the perfection of Christ in withstanding the temptation of Satan. In chapter 8, we are going to see the power of Christ, perfection, Power here in eight. We're going to see the power of Christ over Satan. So another way to say it would be this. In chapter four, here's what Satan cannot do to Christ. In chapter here, this is what, in chapter eight here, this is what Christ can do to Satan. And again, we'll get to that. But an important and rather interesting distinction for the Bible student. You had the perfection of Christ in chapter four. You have the power of Christ in chapter eight. So cool. But what I want us to do here is to begin to put a kind of profile together uh, on this guy, these men, because we're going to see a profound, pervasive, total transformation here upon their encounter with Christ. And and just a great, great picture forthcoming here. But, But here's what you've got before Christ so far, explicitly as we've seen in these three pieces of text. You have got an individual who is naked. He is out of his mind. He is violent. He is self-destructive. He is cutting himself. He has ended up isolated out there in the desert, living among the graves, obsessed with death. This is what demon possession looks like. 
Now, Satan, uh, he, the Bible calls him the destroyer. He wants to steal. He wants to lie. He wants to kill. He wants to destroy. And what we have here in these men, brothers and sisters, this is the will of Satan for a human life. It is his explicit design to try and erase the image of God from these men here. Now, you yourself, if you name the name of Christ, you cannot be possessed by a demon. Understand that, all right? The Bible says your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. There is no congress between the devil and the Spirit of God, all right? 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And yet, while you may not be possessed, you may certainly be oppressed by the destroyer, and he will do that by bringing, by bringing you as close as he can to these guys here. He cannot possess you, you belong to God, but he can oppress you, and he will do so by trying some of these tricks here, right? He wants to isolate you from the church. You ever hear that on a Sunday morning? Don't go to church today. Like Hebrews 10, don't you dare forego the assembling of the saints. You've heard this, right? Like we know these tricks. He wants to isolate you from the church. He wants to isolate you from the people of God. He wants you out of your right mind. He wants you angry, right? Like you get in a conflict at church. What does the devil want you to do? Take your ball and go home. He wants you to run from confession and repentance and just retreat to yourself out there in the desert. Like, if you are a blood-bought, born-again Christian, you understand all of these tactics. Now, he can never get you all the way over there, but you must and should know this is the direction that he desires to move you in. How's he doing? Now, as far as actual demon possession goes, You should know. As I said, my people starve for lack of knowledge, right? As far as actual demon possession goes, you should know that there is only one case recorded in the Old Testament, and that's Saul in 1 Samuel 16. Okay? And then we have this tremendous upsurge take place as God manifests himself in the flesh and Jesus walks the earth. You got this tremendous upsurge to coincide with that. And then after the ascension, after Christ returns to the Father, you see it fall right off to about the level we saw in the Old Testament. Acts chapter 16 is the only time you're going to see that recorded in the rest of the New Testament. Okay? So big upsurge when the Son of God was walking uh, the earth and then where it was before. Now, again, I think if these deliverance ministries popular in the left in the church today, if they could just do a little contextual homework on some of these things, they wouldn't end up being such a black eye upon the body of Christ before the unbelieving community. Like, we're not weird. We're not goofy. Biblical Christianity is an, is an intelligent faith. Now, that does not mean these things don't happen. Don't mishear me. It just means that they are not nearly as normative as all of these deliverance ministries would like you to believe. Uh, these things tend to happen uh, in, in these underdeveloped third world countries where there is an absence of the gospel. Uh, my wife saw quite a bit of this uh, during her seven-year stint on the mission field. My wife was overseas for seven years, and she has some fairly interesting stories there. And so this does happen where there's an, an underdeveloped uh, culture uh, where there is an absence of the gospel, okay, for sure. And of course, it has caught my attention biblically that there is not one recorded account of demon possession having ever taken place in Jerusalem during the time of Christ. That's interesting to me. I find that fascinating. And it seems to be consistent with the, the fact that these things take place away from culturally sophisticated places today. So, so something to ponder. But again, these deliver, deliverance ministries that are so popular on the Christian left, you know, they want to attach a demon to everything. 
right? I mean, you've got the demon of alcohol, you've got the demon of lust, you've got the demon of this, you've got the demon of that. Do you know what the Bible calls anger and drunkenness and lust and these things? The Bible calls them the works of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5. And so, so this Flip Wilson, you older people will get this, right? This Flip Wilson, the devil made me do it theology, right? Like attaching demons to every work of the flesh. Man, that is nothing more than a scapegoat. It's bogus, okay? We should not, now, so we should not be ignoring the reality of these forces, but neither should we, should we be looking for Linda Blair to pop out behind every bush with her head spinning around, all right? If you're young, you're not going to catch any of these references, but that's good for you. But there's a lot of garbage floating out around there. And, and we're not, there's a lot of garbage out there with this stuff. And, and man, I'm telling you, it is not doing the church any favors evangelistically, all right? It's pushing people away. Uneducated Christian people can be the goofiest people going. And that's why so many people are like, man, I don't want a part of that. We practice an intelligent faith, all right? And so as we said to begin our time together today, when, when we lack the discernment to treat these things in the spiritual realm with proper reverence and proper humility, we can begin to get cute with forces we should not be getting cute with. Now, now all of this demonic activity, man, I don't know in my tiny, finite, pusillanimous brain how all this stuff works, and you should run far and fast from anybody that says they do. But look, the Bible tells us these things are real and it does seem that we can mess with and dabble in things that we should not be messing with and dabbling in that can open up some doors that probably should remain shut. Now my guess is these two dudes here at some point in their lives they began to mess with some things they shouldn't have messed with and open some doors that they should not have been opening. And now they've got themselves in some real trouble, don't they? That is a good thing there's Christ. And so, kind of to sum all this up so far, here are these demons. They have taken over the bodies of these men. Christ is now walking the earth. These demons appear to be very, very busy at this time in recorded biblical history. And now here come a number of boats docking up on the eastern shores of the Sea, sea of Galilee, carrying the Son of God, right? Remember Mark tells us there were other boats following Jesus in their boat, right? And so here come these boats now on the eastern shores of the Sea of Galilee, just off this gathering graveyard. And now these two crazy buck naked dudes, that they are determined to be the reception committee. Now, not only is there a reception, but notice there is a recognition as well. Things get very, very interesting here. Verse 29. And they cried out saying, this is so fascinating. They, what business do we have with each other? Underline this son of God. So there's a reception. Now we got a recognition, don't we? They cried out saying, what business do we have with each other, son of God? <laughs> Watch this. Have you come here to torment us before the time? Fascinating. So not only do we have a reception by these demons, plural, really plural as, we're, as we'll see, but we have their recognition as well. Is it not interesting? They know who the son of God is. And by the way, a little Bible trivia for you. Do you know who is the first in the Gospels to recognize Christ as the Son of God? That would be the devil in Matthew chapter 4. Hey, you're the Son of God. Why don't you turn these stones into bread, right? Do you know who the second guys are recorded in the Gospels to recognize Jesus as the Son of God? These boys right here in Matthew 8. And so, so far, it's demons too, humans nothing. Until, of course, we get to Peter in chapter 16. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, right? They have a far easier time recognizing Jesus as the Messiah than humans do. 
<laughs> and of course, we know that demons are fallen angels. And so that much makes sense. What doesn't make so much sense is how many humans still don't recognize him. Now then, so, so these demons are fallen angels, right? They, meaning they were once holy angels uh, before Satan's rebellion. So, so they were involved with God. Man, man they, they know the second person of the Trinity. Nobody needs to help these guys with their Christology. They know that Jesus is their antagonist. They know that he is their judge, right? They know who he is. And so they say to Jesus, what business do we have, son of God? Now watch this. Have you come here to torment us before the time? So, so not only do they have the right Christology, they also have the right eschatology. I mean, they're in effect saying, hey, you're here too soon. It's not time for us to go into the abyss. Right? Now, how do we know that? Here's Luke 8. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, legion, for many demons had entered him. We'll get to that. They were imploring him not to command them to go away into the abyss. Now, we'll get to verse 30 in a minute, but notice verse 31 there. Now, much of this is another Bible study, but the abusos there in the Greek, we believe this is the special place of confinement for those demons that stepped outside of their estate, beginning all the way back in Genesis chapter 6. You had a line that God had put in the, in the sand. Some of these demons had stepped over that line. God then made an extraordinary example of them, locked them up in this bottomless pit of sorts, this infernal cage, this abusos. And now for the rest of the scriptures, you never see a demon step over that line ever again for fear of the abusos. And, and, and that is why you are going to see utter and total compliance here. Go back and get our study in 2 Peter chapter 2 if you want all of this unpacked and fascinating detail. We don't have time to, to do that uh, this morning. But for our purposes here, all right, these demons know there is coming a day when they will be uh, confined to this abusos somewhere under the earth. And so they are saying to Jesus, Son of God, we know you are here before the time. Okay? And so, so fascinating. Not only do they have the right Christology, they appear to have the right eschatology. You, you've got a couple of premillennial, pre-tribulational demons here. Okay? Well, now, well, truth is, well, We've got more than a couple, okay? So back to Luke 8, and we back up just one more verse. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, legion, for many demons had entered him had entered him. Now, Mark also reports this very same intel in Mark 5, 9 uh, for those inquiring minds. Now, legion there, Greek legion, all right? Legion is a military term that is used of a Roman regiment, which, which could be typically 6,000, but it could be anywhere from 5,000 to 8,000. It could be fewer. Uh, Jesus used this word to describe the 12 legions that he could have had at his disposal when he told Peter to put away his sword after Peter went all Van Gogh on that Malchus guy there in the garden, right? Now, uh, there has been a bit of speculation here that perhaps the number of demons was 2,000 because that's the number of pigs that Mark tells us go skydiving off the cliff. Of course, we'll get to that. Fascinating. But the only thing that we can say for sure is that legion in this particular context um, means many. Again, don't ask me. Evidently, the human body can become a kind of multi-family dwelling uh, for these demons, guys. Do not ask me how this works. I do not know, all right? So just strange, supernatural, bizarre stuff here. But, but perhaps the, the most strange 
And, and, and no doubt the most compelling theologically, at least to me, is what we find over in Mark's gospel where, where John Mark is telling us in the original language that legion is worshiping Jesus. You say, well, how is that possible? That is strange indeed. Let me show you. Here's Mark 5. Seeing Jesus from a distance, he ran up and bowed down before him. This is legion, okay? Singular, but we know many. <laughs> Very interesting. That, that word for bowed down there, this is not gray. This is black and white in the Greek. We, we've seen this word over the years. This is proskuneo, all right? And this Greek word, it means to worship, to literally prostrate prostrate oneself down in adoration. In fact, uh, this is how uh, the translators of the King Jimmy have chosen to translate this particular text. When he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him in the King James. Now, you say, well, why are these demons worshipping Jesus? And this is where it gets fascinating. Look right at me. They do not like him. Okay? Their hearts are at enmity against him. They know that he is their adversary. But being angelic beings, fallen ones of course, but being from the angelic realm, they know who he is. And, and the pure, white hot holiness of Christ, listen now, it is utterly irresistible to them. Being in the know, they cannot resist his perfection. Imagine how nuts you would be. Imagine how nuts it would drive you where your chief adversary was so good and so holy that you couldn't help but revere them and worship them despite your feelings for them. We don't have a category for that. Now, now we could talk about Cal and Dawn, I suppose, you know. How Cal is just irresistible to Don, you know, despite his self-acknowledged buffoonery, right? But, but, but we're never really going to get, I mean, we, we just don't have a category for this. And brother, I'm right there with you, believe you me, all right? Most of us are. But can you imagine a day, can you imagine a day when the enemies of Jesus Christ will find the revelation of his glory like, Utterly irresistible. Can you imagine that day? Perhaps you should. The Bible says you should. Here's Philippians chapter 2. God highly exalted him. You know this text. There's just more to it than you thought, all right? And bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Future tense. Every knee will bow. Now watch this. Of those who are in heaven and on earth, and notice now, under the earth, the abusos, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is like, like your, your God is going to be glorified either in mercy or judgment. He's always going to be glorified. Like, which side do you want to be on, right? Judgment or mercy? God, that to the glory of God the Father. There is coming a day at the full revelation of the glorified Christ that his glory and his radiance will be utterly irresistible even to those who have rejected him. And so what we're seeing here in this interesting text in Mark is really a foreshadowing of that, right? Despite being the enemies of Christ, they fully know of his glory. They understand they are standing in the presence of the second member of the Trinity, and one day so will every human being upon this planet. And so look, I mean, I mean man, just, just look, one day, all right, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess, which is, which is of course to say that every human being on the planet will worship Christ at the revelation of his glory. What am I saying? So whether a person likes it or not, they are going to worship Christ. No, no. Do you want to do that now? <laughs> or do you want to do that later on the precipice of hell? Because you're going to do it. Like, like that bitter, um, crushing, 
ripping apart of the depths of your soul when you are face to face with the glory of the one you rejected? Man, you do not want any part of experiencing that. So look, every human being that has ever lived, they are going to bow the knee to Christ. I'm thinking you should probably do that now. All right. Yeah, man. Clap it up. <laughs> For he. All right. So, so we had the reception of it. We should celebrate the glory of God more than we do, man. Sometimes I wonder about you guys being bumps on a log out there. No more decaf for you. So we had the reception of these demons. I'm going to keep saying that. We, we have the recognition of these demons. And now picking it up in verse 30, we are now going to have the requisition of these demons. We had a reception. We've got recognition. We're going to have a requisition. Those are just hooks to hang your learning on so you can learn this stuff. They are going to make what seems to you and I to be a rather bizarre request of Christ and yet pregnant with glorious insight. And so here now in verse 30, friends, we get to what really matters in our passage this morning, all right? And that is our Lord's absolute control and dominion Over the demonic realm, mark it now, verse 30. Now there was a herd of many swine, again, Mark tells us 2,000, feeding at a distance from them. The demons began to entreat him, saying, if you are going to cast us out, send us into the herd of swine. And he said to them, go. Notice that, just one word, just Not burning a crucifix in their head or anything. Like, just go. And they, they being the entire legion, they came out and went into the swine and the whole, what are we reading? They came out and went into the swine and the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and perished in the water. What in the world are we reading? A fascinating passage, but also a very bizarre passage here that sometimes leaves us with more questions than we had before we read it, right? Therefore, let us speak concerning what we do know, and then we can engage in some speculation concerning what we do not know for sure. Now, I think what should rivet our attention here is the absolute control and authority that Jesus has over the demonic realm. Notice here now, they are asking Jesus for permission, right? If you are going to cast us out, send us into the bacon, all right? In other words, to the legion here, it is, listen to me, it is a foregone conclusion that Jesus is not going to allow them to remain in these men. Okay, They know that they are in serious trouble. And that is, of course, why they said in verse 29, have you come to cast us into the abusos before our time, right? You see, I think they know what's coming, and we'll get to all of that in a minute. But they know they will not be allowed to harass these men made in God's image here. And so they are seeking asylum into the pigs, if you will. They're they're seeking permission to go into the pigs. Now, Luke puts this just a, a little little bit more explicitly for us uh, in our understanding here. And it's a very important, important thing to nail to the ground in your theology, all right? Now, there was a herd of many swine feeding there on the mountain, and the demons implored him to permit them to enter the swine. And he gave them permission There it is right there, VXV. Jesus gave them permission. Mark puts it the very same way in Mark 5.19. Look, devils can, look, look right at me. Devils can do nothing apart from the express permission of Christ. If you don't know that, your theology is going to be askew. Devils can do nothing apart from the express permission of Christ. A, a lesson I should think we've learned from perhaps the first two chapters in the book of Job. 
Satan asks God for permission to test Job. God granted that permission ultimately to sanctify his servant Job. And if you've read the end of that story, Job ends up with double the fortune he began with, Job 42, right? Listen to me, VXV. When the Lord allows Satan to bug you, he is doing so for your ultimate good. He is doing so to mature you and to ultimately bless you. You see, the problem with much of the church today is we have developed this false theology. Hear me now. The problem with much of the church is we've developed this false theology where we've got, where we've got this great big Satan in this little bitty Jesus. Where the truth of the scriptures is, it is evidenced right here in our text yet again. We've got a great big Jesus and a little bitty Satan, all right? Now, one of the unfortunate practices that has developed over this backwards theology is on the left in the church, in the church, the Christian left, we have somehow bought into this practice where we begin to somehow think we should be about the business of rebuking Satan. And so we dare to say stupid things like, I rebuke thee, Satan, in the name of Jesus, and all of this garbage. Sometimes we'll throw a thee or thou in there, more of a sting to the rebuke, I guess. I, I don't know. But listen to what Jude tells us in Jude 1. But Michael the archangel, an archangel that just means a very, the highest category of angels, all right? That's what an archangel is, an elite angel. Michael was a warrior. You can read about him in Daniel and Revelation. Watch this. Jude tells us, but Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, that's a different context, but watch what, watch what the text is telling us here. Michael the archangel did not dare to pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you. You understand? If Michael, the elite archangel, the warrior of God, dare not revile the devil, what makes it, what in the world makes the likes of us mess with things we ought not to be messing with? Do you want to know what our biblical responsibility is before the devil? James is all too happy to tell us. Resist him. Submit to God. Submit, therefore, to God. Resist it. Don't rebuke the devil and he will flee from you. All right? Submit, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. You don't need to be walking around rebuking devils, man. You simply need to resist them in your submission to the word of God. It, it, it's, it's very simple. Don't rebuke. Run. Okay? Now, I just love this text. Notice Jesus here. He simply says, go. <laughs> hey, Matthew, one word. Matthew's recording. Like, that's all it took. What I would like you to mark here, VXV, all right? What I want you to mark is the absence of theatrics on the part of Christ. Now, we like to do that stuff, right? Oh, I rebuke thee. And, uh, here's Jesus. Um, yeah, dude, go. All right? I mean, that's it. And they went. Now, Jesus isn't running around chanting in Latin, right? I mean, he's not sprinkling the, the guy's head with holy water. He's not speaking in tongues. He's not burning a crucifix into his forehead, right? Just one word, go. And these guys are out of there. What you should probably know is that they had their, their exorcists in that culture in that day in the very same way that we have ours, so what shocks everybody, VXV, is not that he did it, but how he did it. Okay? Instantly, totally, completely. That's the point of this text. The, the word of the Lord to you today is Jesus has absolute, instant, total, complete, autonomous authority over the demonic realm, and you and I should rest in that. There is nothing to fear by way of demons. They are simply the errand boys of Christ. 
as they were with Job, as they are with these guys. We'll get into the object lesson here in a bit. I want you to rest. We don't need to be afraid of that garbage, all right? Now, here's where we're getting a little bit interesting. Why did these guys ask to go in the pigs? We have to, we can't properly exposit this text without considering this. Why did Jesus allow it? Okay, so just know, now here I'll step away from this Bible because here we're, now we're engaging in speculation, okay? But if we can recognize that, I do have a thought or two I would offer forth here. Bacon was my first thought, but there's really no good theological support in the text for that. Now, I do think, however, that we have a few clues here. We know, what, what do we know? We know that they greatly fear the abusos, right? They have said as much in Luke and Mark. We also know from the Gospels over and over again that Jesus knows what's about to happen, right, before it happens. We also know right here in Matthew that they suspect judgment from Christ if you come to torment us, right? What I believe to be the case here is that maybe these demons knew Jesus was there to judge them, and so they appealed for asylum. Again, they, they appealed for a lesser sentence in these pigs, not knowing that Jesus would send the pigs over a cliff, okay? And there's another important uh, attributional distinction here between God and the enemy. They do not know the future, all right? And so, well, well, in fact, he did send them over a cliff. And so I think at that moment, those demons were sent into the abyss. Okay? Now, that's nothing more than an educated guess, I suppose. But as to why, all right, as to why this whole deal was allowed to play out through these pigs here, why Jesus used pigs. Pigs, this much is deliberately clear, remarkably cool, but we're going to need the rest of the text uh, to put that together. Finally this morning, verse 33, let's take her home. Verse 33, this is awesome. The herdsmen, the pig farmers, all right? The herdsmen ran away and went to the city and reported everything. Now, now notice here, including what happened to the demoniacs, right? In other words, that's not the chief reason they went, but they reported everything, including, so this is presented in the original language as sort of subservient, okay? I find that fascinating. So that's not the chief reason they went to report, but including what had happened, the demoniacs, verse 34, and behold, this is gonna blow your brain. The whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they implored him to leave their region. What? What in the world is going... Why are they rejecting such an obvious and total display of deity? Well, the answer will become clear here, but, but let's set up the extraordinary picture, and it is... Uh, delicious. Number one, these herdsmen, are, these herdsmen are Gentiles, all right? Pigs were very unclean to the Jew, the most unclean, right? And they would not be allowed to raise nor farm pigs. There have been some that have tried to suggest, oh, well, these are the Jews breaking the law. That's just sloppy exposition, all right? These are Gentiles, okay? Jews would not be allowed to raise or farm pigs. Number two, these herdsmen went into the city to report the death of 2,000 pigs, not because they were blown away by Jesus, though no doubt they were, but because they did not want to be blamed for the destruction of valuable livestock. Are you starting to pick up on this? Now, <laughs> Jesus, I just love the word of God. This is so layered and so fascinating. Jesus has just ministered in this massive sweep of northern Israel to the Jews, right? And now, what do we find him doing here? Crossing the lake, or crossing the street, if you will, to minister to a couple of Gentiles in bondage. Some of you are starting to put that together. 
Sound familiar, Bible students? This is a foreshadowing of Jesus taking the gospel to the Gentiles, right? Now, (laughs) which, of course, rejected it, which these guys will too. We'll see this in the coming weeks. Now, what is cooler further still is, here's my question for you. What happened between Jesus ministering to the Jews, which again, they're going to reject him, We'll read about that in the coming weeks. But what happened between Jesus ministering to the Jews and crossing the lake to minister to these Gentiles? What happened between those two events? Well, there was a giant supernatural storm, if you remember, in the middle, right? That was no normal storm. We said those fishermen were totally used to that. It was a fierce supernatural storm. They did not see coming that Jesus took charge of a supernatural storm. Jesus takes charge of between ministering to the Jews and now ministering over here to these Gentiles. What is that a picture of? Well, there was another and greater spiritual storm that took place between Jesus ministering to and being rejected by the Jews and taking the gospel to the Gentiles. What was that greater supernatural spiritual storm? The cross. What an extraordinary picture. Jesus ministers en masse to the Jews. They will reject him. He goes to the cross, endures and takes charge over this supernatural wrath-absorbing storm that we call the cross, has victory over death, even as he had the storm. He then takes the gospel of victory over death across the road to the Gentiles. Listen now, totally delivers them. But the mass of Gentiles will not come. They begged him to leave the region. What did he say in the Sermon on the Mount? The road would be narrow, didn't he? And there would be just a few upon it. These two Gentile demoniacs are cured, but the rest of these people, they went for the pork, right? Yeah. So here's what we have shaking out all of this uh, pig business here. Here's why Jesus did what he did with the pigs, okay? And I want you to understand this scene with me here because it is fascinating, but I need you to pay attention. Jesus comes into the Gentile world. He conquers the devil. He sets the prisoners free. He presents himself as the great deliverer, able to restore life and hope. Now listen carefully. What else does he do? He also takes away the herd of pigs. Which is to say... He takes away the livelihood and the wealth and the material possessions for many in the community. And so what Christ has done here is what Christ always does. He forces a choice, right? Perfect setup here. Will these people choose the power and grace of Jesus to give life and hope? Or will they choose the love of possessions and wealth to be had from these pigs. And of course, I think it's beyond clever. What does the divine artist choose to represent choosing the love and wealth of the world? Pigs. Filthy mud-dwelling pigs. How divine. But will the people choose the power and grace of Jesus to give life and hope? Or will they choose the pig slop of earthly possessions and wealth? And of course, to our utter amazement, they beg Jesus to leave their region. (laughs) 
hey bag Jesus, the life giver, the devil defeater, the hope maker, they beg the loving God of all life and grace to leave. Indeed, the road is narrow, is it not? Let's land the plane. Now, we've had some amazing pictures here. Amazing insight, symmetry. Oh, gosh, the Bible's so perfect. But, but none so fascinating and profound and purposeful as what Jesus had done for these men, this man. None as astonishing as the gospel itself. And so this is where we want to land. This is where we must land over and over again every day of your life or you will wander. So let us go back now real quickly and revisit our profile of the demoniac we know the most about from Mark and Luke, right? And of course we assume representative of both of them, but, but let's take a look at that profile we had uh, compiled we spent no small amount of time discerning these exact things from the three synoptic, synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But, but so, so before Christ, all right, before his encounter with Christ, the explicit condition of the man was naked, out of his mind, self-destructive, isolated there in the desert, obsessed with death. And now over in Luke's gospel, we're going to get an explicit description of the man after his encounter with Jesus Christ. Let's go over to Dr. Luke in Luke chapter 8. The people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus. Like, this is what they saw. Ugh, and they still chose such. And found the man from whom the demons had gone out. Notice now sitting down at the feet of Jesus, clothed. And in his right mind. And they, the people, became frightened. Those who had seen it reported to them how the man who was demon-possessed had been, notice, made well. And then we jump down to verse 39. So he went away. This, this is the, the healed demoniac, no longer a demoniac. The redeemed demoniac went away. He, he, not obsessed with death anymore, is he? He's proclaiming life. So he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city what great things Jesus had done for him. Oh, my. What a remarkable transformation indeed. Listen, there is no friend or family member that is too far gone for Christ to reach. You understand that? Do you understand the hyperbolic nature of the extremity of this man's condition? There is no friend or family member that is beyond the ability of Christ to reach. Now, now I don't know who that friend or family member is for you, but my guess is, my strong guess is, they are not living in a graveyard, running around naked, screaming, screaming and cutting themselves, all right? Now notice what we have here, okay? This man is clothed. He is in his right mind. He has been made well. He is sitting at the feet of Jesus, and he is proclaiming, Christ, do you understand at once what a remarkable contrast the Spirit of God has set up in the Word of God for your wonder and delight and joy and learning prior to his encounter with Christ. He was naked. Now he is clothed. He was out of his mind. And he is in his right mind. He was violent and destructive and now made well. Isolated alone in the wilderness of the desert and now sitting at the feet of Jesus. 
obsessed with death and now proclaiming the giver of life. That, my brothers and sisters, that is the beauty and excellence and value of the gospel brought forth by the beauty and excellence and supreme value and infinite worth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, the Messiah who came to destroy the works of the devil. Now on your left, you have the devil's will for the children of God. On your right, you have the Lord's will for the children of God. To to which of these are you closer? Seems to me that this story has a number of levels of meaning for you and I. I. I believe this now is the word of the Lord to verse-by-verse church this week. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is triumphant over unclean spirits. Jesus is utterly sovereign. There is not a maverick molecule in the universe, right? Jesus liberates the captives. He gives hope to the hopeless. He is the life changer, the difference maker, the game changer, the ceiling breaker, the innovator of your delight. He is infinite in worth and beauty and excellence in value. And yet in the integrity of his perfections and in the benevolence of his holiness, he he still chooses to, to respect your dignity as an image bearer. And so he affords you and I a choice. That's his giving you as an image bearer dignity. That is what love does and so he affords you and I a choice. He sets before you and I a choice. Will you love him and his salvation? Will you see and savor his infinite worth and beauty and excellence and value and glory? Or will you love your earthly prosperity and your earthly wealth? Namely, your pigs. Let's pray. Father in heaven, your word's so strong, so powerful, so benevolent, so holy, so loving, so wondrous, so brilliant. Lord, we're all in very, very different places here today and you delight in giving us mercy. I pray you would bring forth sweet conviction God, where there needs to be that, I pray you would bring forth encouragement and rest and hope and delight that we can't lose. We can't lose with you. And if we wish to pursue a greater level of joy and delight, you are holding it out before us week after week after week. You have broken our chains, Lord. What amazing, astonishing grace you have given to us. And help us to just come all the way in this year to your beauty and benevolence and bountiful glory. God, you're so good. I could sit up here and praise you for hours. Would you accept our worship that's about to happen here as just our love for you and our wonder and our amazement and and our invitation to transform us more and more, degree by degree, into your beautiful glory. So good, so sweet. We ask these things in Jesus' name. The people of God said, Amen. Amen. All right, let's worship.